Um, so I guess we can get started here. Uh, it might be a little early, but we got a standing room only crowd here. So let's just, uh, I don't want to waste your time. Let's get after it. So I'm going to show you a lot of crazy stuff today. Let's see here. Let's get to the slides. Excellent, because that's what you're hearing about is slideware. Do you think I crammed enough words in the title of this? It's almost like I'm trying to do search engine optimization on my slides or something, right? Get it all picked up, you know? So I know most of the time when we talk about mobile and everything, we're all focused on apps. And I'm focused on apps and stuff like that. And, you know, we talked yesterday about building enterprise apps, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, building some really medieval giant mega apps. Um, but I can't give... Yeah, you know, I don't want to give HTML5 the short end of the stick. You know, I know lots of people have different opinions about HTML5 versus native. Um, there's a group of people who are like, we're all in with HTML5. We want to be able to target multiple platforms easily. Um, there's other people who are like, yeah, it sucks. It's too, it, it doesn't perform well enough, or it can't do everything I can do in a native app, or it's not rich enough. I think the truth is somewhere in between. I think. What, no matter what you or I think, personally, there's also larger megatrends happening that may drive your behavior regardless of what you think about things. Because you know, I know we're all in the business of making money, and so we have to deliver solutions for our companies, for our clients, and things like that that help them be productive and give them what they want. So, uh, so HTML5 is certainly part of that equation. So to give you another option to fill out your portfolio of mobile stuff, it's good to make sure that HTML5 is in your, is in your little bag of tricks, right? Uh, somewhere along, so also to get started out, uh, hopefully everybody got the little survey thing to fill out. So make sure you're filling that out at some point, and then we'll hand it in, and we'll, we'll do a drawing for a free phone. And then probably even more exciting than a free phone, I will ask a question during this session based on what I talk about, and then someone will get a copy of my new book which is not related to Windows Phone at all. It's actually tablets. I, I went rogue <laughs> and wrote a tablet app book. You know, why not, right? Let's just keep them guessing, OK? So, uh, so anyway, can you tell that some marketing PR firm got a hold of my slides and changed the title from whatever mundane title I came up with? I really love this technology, and I love talking to people. And anyway, all aboard. All right, so anyway. Uh, I do mobile strategy stuff at Microsoft. Um, I, I'm probably one of the old timers in mobility, which means I've been on the roller coaster ride back from the pocket PC days. Uh, and all the incarnations of our, that group and how we've done pocket PC to smartphone. Remember when we had a phone and we literally called it smartphone, like we invented the word. And then we did Windows Mobile. Uh, and then we did Windows Phone 7. We rebooted our platform, and now we're, we rebooted it again with Phone 8. We put Windows NT inside the phone. We just literally crammed it in a little phone. Um, so anyway, I like to blog a lot on mobile strategy. And you know, I'll get geeky, and, and I like to write a lot of code and stuff like that. And I like to talk about high-level, giant architectural things like building a big mobile app enterprise application platform for your company using the Microsoft technology you already own uh, to build that kind of stuff. And so uh, definitely check out my blog to see all that kind of stuff, lots of blueprints for some freaky, crazy things. Um, and then Andy Wigley and I did uh, 20 hours of videos last uh, November. Uh, you can check that out on Channel 9, and it's, it's, it's fun stuff. You know, it's crazy. If you look, if you squint, you'll see one of the Java magazines on the right, the far one. It looks like an IPAC on there for, for, uh, for the, in the Java magazine. For the Java 1 2001 conference, yes, I used to go to Java 1 conferences every year. Maybe you did, too. I don't know. I'm very opportunistic. I wrote all those different waves. And so, uh, but I love the Pocket PC, and I, I wrote an article on how to build Java apps on the iPad and everything, and it was crazy. Just like mixing it up with a tablet app book. So short and sweet, we're just going to talk about, I'm going to, I used to do a whole session where I did nothing but talk about best practices, uh, which is good stuff. I've been doing these mobile web sessions for a few years now, and again, because I was the only one who's doing it at Microsoft, 
you know, at least on the mobile side. And so I figured, you know, if nothing else, I'll just be this lone voice out there going, oh, by the way, if you want to do a mobile website. And that's evolved over time, you know, from just uh, the best practices around memory, you know, lightweight, things like that. Uh, but now things are, we have richer browsers that do more things. And so uh, I will kind of, I'm going to split it from web best practices, and then I'll go crazy on all the HTML5 capabilities that you get in IE10 on the phone or on the tablet. And yes, I'll be an equal opportunity, you know, mobile person, tablet and phone. Has anybody seen this tablet before? This is the Lenovo Tablet 2. Yeah, I know lots of people, they know about the Surface RT and Surface Pro. And uh, they may not know that there's this other category of tablets right in the middle that's running the Clover Trail processor. We are all thinking and working with customers, and lots of them are deploying iPads. And they like the 10 hours of battery life and all that fun stuff. And I would find that this tablet here is overlooked, and it shouldn't be because this tablet also has 10 hours of battery life, and it's thin and lighter than the iPad, and it's x86 compatible. It's running the Clover Trail system on a chip from Intel. And so you can domain join it, and you can manage it like your other PCs, and you can do all that fun stuff and run all your existing Win32 apps that you've been running to run your business for the last couple of decades. So uh, take a look. I'm a, I'm a big fan. This thing weighs nothing. It's a, it's a great device. So let's get going here. Let's get the clicker. So, you know, there's our friends at Gartner. And so this kind of speaks to, this little statement here speaks to, no matter what you or I think personally about HTML5, and sometimes when Gartner makes these statements, it's some analyst who's just, you know, pontificating or predicting the future, and maybe they're wrong. But sometimes, or a lot of times, Gartner gets all these phone calls from customers. That's, that's their main thing, is they answer questions from, they, they do surveys for uh, companies all over the world, just like Forrester does and lots of other analyst groups. Uh, and they answer questions. And based on that, they get a vibe, a feel, for what the pulse is at big companies around the world. And so sometimes that pulse informs what they say. And so what they're saying is, no matter what we think about native versus HTML5, and I know everybody got their feathers ruffled, all the web people did when Facebook went from their hybrid app for Android and iOS and went back to native. And people were like, yep, see, I told you, HTML5 sucks, you know. Um, but there's a, there's a bigger mega trend afoot here, especially if you think about the enterprise. There's, uh, you know, because we clearly, when you think about the difference between consumer and the enterprise, Big businesses, they just need to get stuff done. They need to crank stuff out to make their employees productive or people in the field or whatever. And so they might not be as focused on building the richest, most beautiful, 3D, cool, whatever thing that consumers might love. You know, I have a real simple view of most enterprise apps. You might agree with me or not. I think 80, 90, whatever percent of apps, they all do the exact same thing. They pull down data from a database or some back-end system, tells you where to go, what to do, whatever. You look at the data, you manipulate the data, you capture some new data, and then you send it back. That's it. That's most enterprise apps in a nutshell. Almost all of them do just that. So if we think of it that way, it's not that complicated. You'll have some business logic mixed in, you know, workflows, but whatever. I'm pulling down data, I'm looking, I'm editing, I'm capturing, I'm sending it back. That's all I'm doing. So you can start to get to the point, go, well, you know, if that's what I'm doing mostly in the enterprise anyway, then maybe HTML5 and some of the new features there are good enough. Sometimes good enough is good enough, right? Especially if you're just grabbing data and capturing and sending it back. Oh, boy, you've probably seen this slide before if you've been to any of our sessions. Yes, Windows Phone is built for business. Consistent experience across all the platforms. Uh, you know, I think the big takeaway, and I, I kind of did it in my session yesterday, you know, the commonality, the same kernel running in the, everywhere, different apps sharing, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the code across platforms, whether it's the tablet or a big all-in-one or whatever, the phone. You've got all our office products running across platforms, uh, building your native apps that, you know, again, reusing code. And then, of course, our management story, you know, MDM, application management, information management, things like that with System Center and Intune. 
So we're building a great all-up story around mobility. But I digress. Let's jump back into this session instead of that uh, service announcement. It's almost like the more you know thing on NBC, right? All right. UX best practices. I'm going to just kind of walk you through little bullets, little tips and tricks uh, that, that I've, I've seen over the years that make a difference. So this, this first thing here, and again, there's this notion, we've had the mobile web for a long time. Lots of you probably use the mobile web all the time on your device, and lots of new sites, and they're kind of like what you see on the left-hand side, all kinds of them. They've been formatted for mobile devices. They're just mostly text with a few pictures here, and they just scroll vertically, and they're very lightweight. Uh, and so that's, that's a, an example of a good mobile web app. On the right-hand side is the same New York Times in desktop mode. That's not a good example of a mobile web app. So just because a mobile browser can render the full giant website, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, you know, The Economist, whatever, it doesn't mean it's a good user experience. Pinching, zooming, all that stuff, those aren't features. Those are hacks. They are hacks. Did I, I'm going to probably get fired. Anyway. <laughs> No, no, but they are, what are they? They're workarounds. They're workarounds because they know that you're going to find yourself hitting full-size websites and they're not usable. And so you're going to need a pinch and zoom to read the stuff. It's not a good user experience for mobile. So what's better is to get ahead of things, and if you're building for mobile, perhaps you've heard a bigger megatrend about mobile first and building for mobile from the get-go, and then everything else comes later. Maybe that's the kind of things you should be thinking about. So let's go do kind of a lightning round. I think I've got about four slides where I'm just going to just kind of blaze through some things here, and I'll just kind of give you some color commentary. We'll pretend we're on ESPN or something like that. Some of these will be real obvious to you. So what's a top-of-line form field mean? So, you know, if you're, you're building forms, web forms, you know, text boxes, labels, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to capture data, whatever. My phone's alive over there. Don't put things, you know, don't have a label here and then a text box next to it. Have them stacked on top of each other. That's that simple. Because you need to always be kind of thinking of this vertical, narrow web for devices. And then it might get a little wider for tablets, right? So think like that. Think that there's no room, because you don't want things going off the side or wrapping or looking strange. <clears throat> Separate your cascading style sheet files and your JavaScript files from your HTML. <clears throat> Way back when, when we all learned about the web in the mid-'90s or whenever you got into it, you know, we put the script stuff right in the HTML page, and we put styles. When styles came along, which came along later, you know, later in the 90s, and then, uh, and then you could start pointing to them in separate files. I know this sounds really rudimentary, but it's important for mobile web, especially because, you know, you're thinking about bandwidth and lightweight and performance and things coming fast. So if you point to them separately, then what happens is the browser downloads your first page, pulls the JavaScript file and your CSS file down, then on all your subsequent pages, it's cached those two things locally in your browser, and it doesn't have to keep retrieving bigger web pages that have it included. So, so it's, it's just about bandwidth. Minimize the need for text input. This is actually an all-up mobile thing, mobile native apps or whatever. It's a horrible user experience on a native app or a web app if you have an app where it's full of big text boxes and lots of free-form text capture things. If a person, in order to get their job done, is having to just type and type and type lots of stuff, you have mega failed. You need to give them choices instead. You need to have a screen full of combo boxes and lists and radio buttons and check boxes and things like that. Keep the typing to a minimum. Let them choose things so that they can rapidly just go ching, 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 ching to give them a better user experience. This is an interesting one. The top 20 most important content from the desktop. So when I talk to a lot of companies, and they've got their big, giant desktop website that they've built over the years, and it's got a million things on it, and it's huge. And they say, yeah, I want to I put that whole thing on the phone. And I'm like, that's just crazy talk. You know? um, they ask for it. The takeaway here, find the 20% most important things from their existing desktop website and put them on the web. Right? You know, so as we, as we evolve over time, you know, am I gonna, is my banking mobile website gonna allow me to take out a loan like the desktop one might? No, it's not. Is my airline site gonna allow me to make new reservations and a bunch of other stuff? Maybe not. 
It's going to let me quickly glance and go, quickly glance, quickly and go, oh, yeah, my flight's late, or whatever. That's what that's for, just quick data snacking, right? So don't go nuts on that. Minification, do you know what minification is? Some people do. All right, there's lots of tools that have been around from Yahoo and a whole bunch of other people, and I think we have it built into Visual Studio now. Um, basically what minification is, is uh, unlike native code where you have all kinds of white space everywhere around your code, but when you compile it, all that goes away and it doesn't make your file size bigger or anything like that. Well, the opposite's true on the web. Your HTML page that you've beautifully formatted with all your HTML syntax and everything, all that white space counts against you. It absolutely does. So have you ever, you know, so if you go to different websites and you right click on the page and you do view source, and sometimes you see beautiful web stuff, HTML, and then maybe you go to, let's say a Google website, for instance, and you right click on that and you see all text crammed together and you go, wow, that's ugly. Those guys at Google don't know what they're doing when it comes to the web. They're a bunch of idiots. No, they're smarter than all of us because they know that cramming it all together makes it faster. Remember, we all are so caught up in developer things, in productivity, in things we love, and things we think are so important. The user could care less about what we think as developers. The user wants it to rock. They want it to be fast. They want it to work. They could care less about how, what we feel about developing. You know? So that's the takeaway there. So minify, compress everything together. Here's a weird one you've probably never heard of. There's transcoders. So go back in time, let's say to the late 90s, going into the beginning of the 2000s, we had feature phones that started to have web browsers on them, and they did HTML, and then they did WAP pages based on cards and things like that, and then they started doing, yeah. We have started doing rudimentary, lightweight web pages, maybe kind of HTML 3.2 kind of stuff, right? Um, anyway. All the mobile operators back at the time were like, wow, we got a real problem here. We got all these people on these brand new feature phones with web browsers doing, using high speed things like GPRS or 1XRTT. And uh, these giant websites are not fitting on these little screens. How can we help these people? Oh, I know, let's build these transcoder servers all over the whole globe, all around the planet. So that whenever someone on a mobile phone goes to a big giant website, it's gonna go through a transcoder and go through a meat grinder and be crunched into something smaller that we decide is what you think you want to look at. Well, today, you don't want those transcoders screwing up your web page. You're building a mobile web page and you have it looking exactly like you want it to look and you've tested it on every phone and tablet and stuff like that. These transcoders are still in operation all over the world. They have not all been decommissioned yet. So, there's a little stuff you can put in your HTML, a little cache control, no transform. It tells those things, leave my HTML alone. All right, what else we got? Link JavaScript at the bottom of the page before the closing body tag. Why in the world would you do that? You know, typically, you know, we put our point to our JavaScript up in the head, right? Well, it's all about perception. Why did we start doing background threads when we were loading forms and screens? Because we wanted the screen to load faster, and so we did background processes to help it. It's the same thing here, it's perception. Because remember, a web page, you know, what's a browser? It's just a text parser, that's all it is. And it, text, it parses from top to bottom as it reads pages. And so it's going Well, when it gets to your JavaScript up at the top, it goes uh, And then it starts crunching through all the JavaScript and you have to wait while it does that before your page loads. If you put the JavaScript at the bottom, which you can, unless you're needing to do like a, a body on load event, if you put it at the bottom, the whole page loads and the person has the perception of speed and then the JavaScript loads silently and visibly at the end, and the user doesn't know any better. So it's just perception. This is another big thing for me on web apps, native apps, whatever. Each page should only have a single function or idea. Um, I remember in the 90s, people used to build these apps in VB, and Power Builder, and Delphi, and everything, Java, that where we just crammed every kind of control, a million things onto one screen. It was like mission control at NASA and stuff like that. And that we thought we were really doing great because we put everything on one screen. Um, and so we probably had like 25 different functions and a thousand different ideas all in one place. And, and so we had to build these big training manuals so people could learn what in the world was going on there. Well, that's the opposite of a good user experience. Make sure each page, or for that matter, when you're building your native, your native apps, each one, keep it simple. 
You know, we, you know, we have all these modern UI, formerly known as Metro, you know, design principles, typography, large sizes of UI elements that are touchable, spread far apart. Please waste space. Make sure each screen is only about one simple little thing that requires no training manual at all. And please waste space. Don't feel like, oh, you know, I've got some more pixels left here. I think I could cram in a list box or something. You know, don't do it. Waste space. Make it simple for the user so that they don't feel confused. Bandwidth thing. Use turn on web server compression. Part of half of it's turned on by default on IIS, and you can check another checkbox to turn on the dynamic stuff. Uh, and then you know, so the whole gzip inflate all that kind of stuff deflate. That's, that's real stuff. You get a lot of benefit by compressing all that stuff going across like that. No doubt about it. So here's some little stats that I'm kind of pepper in here. Look at that. 74% of the people will leave the mobile site if it doesn't load in five seconds. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty harsh, man. Five seconds, it's like, oh, this site sucks. I'm out of here. You know? Well, that's reality. So think about that when you're building your mobile web pages, each page. If it doesn't load in less than five seconds, you might have people who are saying adios. Look at that. A one second increase in load time results in 11% fewer page views, 16% decrease in customer sat, and 7% loss in sales conversions. So it kind of goes along with the one above it. Speed is your friend. People like fast stuff. People like those compressed Google pages, don't they? And that are got compression turned on on the web server and all that kind of stuff. So here's your goal. Keep those web pages, each one, under 20K. I know you're like, yeah, you're crazy. You're insane. There's no way I can make a web page that small. Especially the W3C released, uh, I think, last year, some horrifying statistic that the average web page now has grown to one meg in size. Can you imagine that? I mean, I don't know how many people have been doing web development you know, since the 90s and see where we went. We all went from really plain looking pages that kind of look like the Google homepage to now we've got everything going on and we're downloading billions of images and all kinds of stuff. And now the average page is one meg. And maybe you can get away with that on the desktop. But you cannot ever get away with it on a phone or a tablet. Because remember, part of the, part of the performance is the CPU crunching power to parse it fast. The other part is bandwidth and other things like that. And, uh, and remember, just because you have a 4G data plan doesn't mean you always have those consistent speeds because it's you and, you know, 12 or 1,500 of your best friends connected to the nearest cell tower, going down to the base station, jumping on the backhaul network, flying onto the internet, going to the website, hitting the front firewall, going through the DMZ, hitting the back firewall, queuing up on the website, finally getting your response, and then going back through that whole process again and back out to your phone or your tablet. So shoot for 20K. You may not get there, but keep that in mind. So like I said earlier, use larger fonts. Sounds counterintuitive, you know? I'm on a small screen. I need to cram more junk on there, don't I? No, cram less junk. Make them bigger. Big typography. Especially for people that are older who cannot see as well, like me. Design for the 80 pixel finger. I know that seems like a fat finger, but there's a lot of fat fingering going on these days on mobile devices, isn't there? Um, so, all these little tiny UI elements that we've been building over the years designed for a mouse are not going to cut it, you know, for the finger. So make sure all those buttons, all those UI elements are huge, huge. Please waste space. Make them simple and touchable. If you have to create more pages to get across what you're trying to do, then do it. Make them go to more pages in a wizard, in a whatever, a workflow. But keep things big. And also keep them separate, too. Big hit elements, but make sure, because when we talk about fat finger, how many times have you had two buttons next to each other and you touch both of them at the same time, right? So keep them wide. So we have server-side and client-side device capability methods, you know, where you're trying to figure out what kind of device you're looking at. Now, sometimes you're just doing the most basic, basic HTML, which is great that you know is just going to work anywhere. But as you start to do some more capabilities, more things with JavaScript, more functionality, and you're not really sure. This Werfel database, this was a XW3C guy, I think, in Italy. He's been maintaining this. I think there's like tens of thousands of unique devices all listed in this database. And there's a .NET connector on ASP.NET that you can use to talk to that. Uh, and there's, there's some other ones, too, actually. 
that, so it will auto detect when that person comes to your page, you know, whether or not what kind of device it is, and then it can tell you, oh, this device will can do AJAX, this one can't, and you know, those kind of things, right? And then JavaScript on the client side. I remember watching a great session where the guy, it was a Microsoft guy, was, and it wasn't even a mobile web thing, it was desktop still, and it was basically saying instead of looking at that agent string to figure out what browser it is, because that's not, that's not foolproof, sometimes you just assume, because I saw Mozilla, whatever, blah, 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 that all this is going to work, and then you get burned when it doesn't. And so the idea of is uh, do it in JavaScript, always test capabilities, you know, if this object exists, then use it. If, you know, always that defensive programming we learned way back when, right? You can test capabilities before using them, and if they don't exist, then you can either just not use them or fall back gracefully. That's another way to just not care about what browser it is. You're not, uh, you know. Multiple linked resources. If you have lots of hyperlinks in your page that point to all kinds of other places, I know you don't think about it, but people who are speed freaks uh, in the web deal, they actually analyze a DNS lookup to figure out a link. Those, those all have a consequence. I know you'd think it doesn't happen. I know it seems like it's just magic and the page just loads and you got links to all these other sites on your page. DNS lookups happen for all those things. It slows down your page. The viewport meta tag. Uh, I think I have a slide I should talk about what that is or where I show it. But basically, uh, you put the viewport meta tag in there and it really takes that giant New York Times thing and says, no, I'm looking at a device that's only this big, make it look appropriate for that. And so that really helps with markup for mobile devices. All right, so let's move on a little bit more. Has anyone ever heard of responsive design? Of course you have. All right, so I've been spending quite a few years doing mobile web and the whole thinking was, I'm going to detect the browser or something, and I'm, I'm, I'm either going to send you to the desktop site or I'm going to send you to the m.blahblahblah.com site for the mobile site. And then comes along uh, CSS3 and media queries, which kind of like the testing capabilities with JavaScript lets you say, hey, you know, if the browser viewport width is this deal, then I'll show this, and if it's that, show this. And so... Uh, it gives you that capability to dynamically, based on the size of the browser and the device, to uh, sh render something different. So, but you know what? This is not without controversy. Those of you who raised your hands who know what responsive design is, a subset of you also know that there's a raging debate in that world right now. Because there's a whole lot of people that think that responsive design is a nirvana silver bullet for this whole thing, and that's the way to go. Then there's a whole bunch of other people who maybe initially embraced it and then went, oh, wait a second, guess what happens? So let me give you a quick scenario. And there's some new technologies in IE that can get around what I'm talking about, but for the most hand, most of this doesn't work. So responsive design, I'm going to build once and run anywhere. I'm going to, and so I build my, have my mobile and it stretches out to the tablet and it stretches out to the desktop and it's dynamic and it's all good, right? But there's a problem with most browsers. What happens is even though the size looks correct, it still downloads all the desktop stuff secretly, hot, hidden. And so you still have a negative impact to the whole performance deal. So uh, that desktop one meg web page that you built is still coming down to your little smartphone. That was not your intention at all. Your intention was your 20K thing for the smartphone and maybe a little bigger for the tablet and maybe whatever for the desktop. So responsive design helped fix the UI differences. It didn't necessarily fix how much junk is being downloaded. And so it may secretly defeat the purpose. Um, but there's some, there's some new features that will help to detect that and get around that as well. But, uh, but anyway, that rages on. And so a whole lot of responsive people have actually gone back to saying, nope, I'm going to send people to a dedicated mobile site because I'm not getting good enough performance. So this is just kind of a quick view. And throughout this session, instead of me walking, so tomorrow when I do code, I'm going to spend the whole session doing F10, F11, stepping through code, and it's going to be crazy, and I hope you can tolerate that. This one, I decided I won't do that to you, so I'm going to show, I'm going to have tons of screens, you'll have all the slides that actually show you the code to make all the things I'm going to talk about work, and it's real easy. So this is just a quick glimpse, uh, and this is not in any kind of detail, but in your CSS file, 
you just use this media screen and you put a max width. And so the takeaway here is that when it says the max width 480 pixels show a body like this. And so inside those tags, you know, inside those curly braces, you put all the stuff in there that says, when I see this size, show this. And then this one below here, when it blows out to 650 pixels, show that instead. So let me do a little demo here. And let's go to the Wolf Vision, formerly known as Elmo. I'm going to turn on my little ThinkPad here. And I'm going to show you the same thing. I've got to re-log in, so I apologize. Just bear with me. Okay. So there's my little tablet. And I've got my media query here. And so you may have seen this. just on our test drive site. Anyway, if you look at it, you see the, the images here in two columns. If, on the other hand, I flip it and I go like that, the columns change, the image sizes change, and the text changes. That's kind of the gist of it. If I look at the, now let's look at the same thing on the phone. So here, too, is the same page, of course it's all dark, but here on a phone with a smaller viewport and it's not as bright so you can't see it as well, I apologize, you can kind of see the picture of the flowers there. Notice how at this size in the media query it dropped it down to a single column and sized it again. So that's kind of the gist of this whole thing with media queries is, is, is and so you remember in the 90s how we used to build everything using tables, and we put tables within tables and within cells and stuff like that, and that's how we formatted the web page and everything, and then a whole bunch of people said, stop doing that, CSS, you know. So anyway, here's the takeaway. Use CSS for columns, and so as you can imagine, the progression, a single column on the phone, and then here on the tablet, depending on the width of the tablet, I can go farther out, and the same site, if I was like on, on a big, you know, 27 inch screen, you know, it might be showing three or four columns, stuff like that. So that's, that's, that's the quick takeaway on that stuff. So yeah, pretty cool. All right, let's get to the heart of things. You know the UX stuff now. Let's talk about all the HTML5 features. Now you may have been to other web sessions around HTML5 where they spent the whole time talking about CSS and transforms and 2D and 3D and all that kind of stuff. I am so not that guy. So um, I'm here about building apps, and those things are not about building apps. Those are about making things look pretty. Building apps is how do I make web things act like native apps? In order to do that, what do I need? I need to be able to call web services. I need to download data. I need to save data offline. I need to do things that native apps do. So I'm only going to talk about this stuff because this is how you get work done. So I'm going to talk about, this kind of gives you this little grid here, this chart table shows you across the major four brow, uh, you know, browsers on the top smartphones out there of the kind of capabilities, the web storage, geolocation, audio video canvas, HTTP web requests, you know, for calling your AJAX stuff, new form elements, you'd be amazed, uh, web forms now. I mean, they have sliders and all kinds of cool things that used to be what we would think of as custom controls, right? App cache, web sockets, workers, index DB. So you're pretty much across most of the mobile platforms getting all these things if you're on the latest and greatest. I would say the only glaring exception is Safari on iOS doesn't support index DB, which is a which is kind of a glaring one, especially if you're going to do bigger data sets of things. So it's something to kind of think think about. Um, it's kind of funny having the four there. So Everybody, I hope everybody's pumped that we're number three. <laughs> I'm not going to go chanting around going, we're number three. We're number. Um, uh, there was some news, actually. I know, you, I know you probably read the news in the last month or so about us solidifying our third place deal ahead of BlackBerry. There was a uh, news that came out yesterday, actually. I think Larry Lieberman showed it, shared it. Uh, I think we've hit 5.6% in the U.S. market share, which is great for the U.S., there are dozens of other countries where we're over 10%, over 15%, over 20% already. 
So little pinpoints of excitement happening all over the world, with, and it's all about Phone 8, because it's the real deal. Um, so I'm really excited. Lots of countries, we are outselling the iPhone and Android, it just depends. Lots of countries, which, you know, if I think about it, we live in a bubble here in the US, because we live in this unreal world where mobile operators basically rent phones to us. They subsidize the total cost of the phone so that we only have to pay 200, 99, 50, whatever it is. So we have no idea what the cost of the real phone is. In most of the world, you have to buy the phone first. And so you feel the pain. And economics drives your decisions way more elsewhere than it does here. And so elsewhere, you see, you get a real pulse of what real people can do, right? Well, guess what? Our lower cost, but super awesome, like lower end Nokia phones and Huawei and stuff like that, they are killing it in other countries you know, where people have to pay for that phone first. So this is goodness for all of us here, you know, building apps and things like that. Uh, we, are, we are racing ahead, so it's all good. So let's just talk about IE10. Hardware accelerated video, rendering of the HTML, canvas, the drawing, all that kind of stuff. This is a big deal, making sure we have that hardware acceleration. Remember, we have that chassis specification on the phone, so we define GPUs and things like that. That's how our phone can hardware accelerate all that stuff. This is a big deal. What are we trying to do? We're trying to blur the lines between the web and native, aren't we? So then we do it a little bit more with JIT compile JavaScript. So JavaScript is the language of the web. And so if I'm, it's one thing if I'm just building a marketing brochure website, you know, but if I'm building web apps based on a lot of the functionality I'm gonna walk you through here, JavaScript performance matters. JavaScript, or I think, I think Scott Hanselman was talking about JavaScript being the assembly language of the web or something like that. All right, maybe it's not that, but, <laughs> but it seems like. It. So anyway, super important for what we're going to talk about. Smart screen filtering, um, blocking malicious websites. We have the most secure browser in the world. Every analyst, every, everybody says it. That, there's no question. We block all that malware from coming down. I talked to you yesterday how our browser runs in an isolated container. And so even if something bad could get down, it's not going to attack the rest of your phone. HTML5 sandbox. That's not the sandbox that I was just talking about, a container. There's actually an HTML5 deal about sandboxes. It has to do with when you're doing iframes and how you could get to some insecure data from an iframe. Into, anyway, we support that stuff. We had to support that because of what we did on big windows with WinJS for building HTML5 native apps with WinJS. We had to get all of that stuff working in order to do that. I talked yesterday about data sense content compression can save you up to 50% of data going over the air. So that helps speed, it helps bandwidth, it also saves you money because you can get a cheaper data plan for the same amount. All right, so now you saw that list from the table. I'm just basically gonna mindlessly walk through all those features. I'm gonna give you a caller commentary about each one and then um, I'll show you some code. So geolocation, we like to use our mapping, right? And figure out where we are. Well, you can do that on the web too, and it's just mindlessly easy. <clears throat> so just like your native geolocation stuff that you may have built, because location-based stuff is all the rage, isn't it? So the same JavaScript API, guess what? You know it, it's just pumping into the native platform and using the same capabilities that your native app is using, you know? And so I think we all kind of know, you know, from most accurate to least accurate, GPS is the best, but you gotta be outside, and it drains battery the longer you have it on. IP address, there's IP address and Wi-Fi databases all there that help, and then there's cell tower triangulation is, is your kind of your fallback. Not only can you grab that snapshot of where you are at any moment and get that lat long, but you can also do it to track movements, like you might in a navigation system in a car. So now we've gone beyond, I have a map, I see I'm here now, now I can do some code where I'm walking or I'm driving and it's following me. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. Measuring distance between two coordinates. Who knows, you might actually wanna know the distance between here and here. Like if you're driving somewhere, you know, you've got, you know, 400 kilometers to go. And of course, just like native apps, it's not gonna be big brother, because I know a lot of people in different businesses, their employers sometimes like wanna install things that track everything they're doing. Anyway, it always asks users permission. So here's the quick and easy code for just grabbing a snapshot of your current location. 
So look at the top there. It looks like that crazy defensive programming I was talking about where you're testing for a capability. If navigator.geolocation exists, then we're going to grab the current position. And then I pass a parameter. I call this display location function that I wrote down here at the bottom. Look how mindlessly easy this is to grab lat and long. And then I just pop up an alert box. You can plug that in with your mapping, with your Bing maps, of course, and uh, to show that stuff. So this is pretty simple. Tracking movements. Here, it's, it's pretty similar, but a little bit different. We have this watch ID variable that we have in our, and this is just in our JavaScript. Uh, and then we kind of have the idea, call start, you might have buttons on the screen, start and stop function to start it. And so basically what it does, it does this watch position and figures out the Latin long calling that function from the last screen and just keeps pumping that into that variable. And so there, as you make a, an appreciable movement that, that makes sense you know, in, in GPS world where it says, oh, yep, you really moved, it'll fire an event and, and give you that new coordinate. Here's one where you can compute distance. Uh, and again, you've got these slides. I thought I'd just put all the code on the slides so it'd be easy for you to take it. So this is just, you know, if you want to compute how many kilometers away you are from one place to another. I did a demo where I was seeing how far I was in Redmond and how far away it was from the Trident submarine base over on the Olympic Peninsula. Anyway, don't want to go into detail here, but here's the code, and you can just copy and paste it, and it just works. Don't you love code that just works that you can copy and paste? Isn't that OO programming, right? <laughs> All right, web storage. This is the lightweight storage. You know, so we need data offline. That's we, that, remember in, way back when we started building native apps for pocket PCs and Windows mobile devices? We didn't necessarily build native apps because they were richer. We needed it because the web meant you had to always be connected, and you can't count on that. And we needed to store data. I pulled down data, I store it, I capture data, I store it. So here's web storage. We've actually had this since IE8. So it's, it's just five meg, name value pairs, real simple. Um, and, it, and it stores it until you, until you explicitly clear the data out. Um, but anyway, the cool thing here is you can close the browser, close the tabs, reboot your phone, and the data is still there. So for some segment of your apps that you're building, this might be sufficient uh, and completely fine. And again, think about it. We used to use cookies. Well, we still use cookies. But a lot of people would send cookies and keep doing round trips to maintain all that data. Use cookies things for session only type stuff, you know, for the user and stuff like that. But for bigger data you need to save, try to give this web storage thing a spin. I'm not going to just mindlessly tell you about it without showing you code. Look how stupid simple this is. It's kind of like working with cookies. Local storage, set item. The key, it's just key value. So whatever you want to call the key, and then there's the value. And so you can do set items. You can put in a string. You can put in an integer. You can use an indexer to do it. And then down at the bottom, retrieving it. Get item by key. You know. Uh, and if it's an integer, because remember, everything on the internet is really a string, right? Um, then you can just use the parsent to pull it back. So pretty simple to set and restore. Oh, but there's more. We can do arrays. Get out of town. All right. So we can do arrays in this little storage. I thought we could just do simple strings. So here I build this little car array in JavaScript, you know, and so I have the three different cars. And then I have, I just set the item to car array. And then here's one of my favorite things about that's built into the web in JavaScript is json.stringify and json.parse. JSON is the way we serialize data on the internet. Uh, and so we just, Look how simple that was. We took an array, and all we did was just say stringify, and it knew what to do. And it turned that array into an adjacent equivalent string and pumped it in there. And then when we pull it out, we just parse, and we got it back, and you have your array again. Pretty cool. Oh, but there's more. I can do objects in web storage, not just arrays. So here's a JavaScript object, a car object, that's got a, a, a make and a color. And then I, do, I new up the object, and I, I create a new one, a black Mercedes, and then I use the same stringify thing, and it stringifies the object as JSON. So this is just getting pretty cool, isn't it? It's almost like real programming, almost, right? Oh, my gosh, arrays of objects. Wow, wow. This is almost like that video I was showing you where I just kept having everything explode on the screen. Uh, just more and more. So here I build my function which is my, how we do objects in JavaScript. 
uh, and then I do that, and then I, you know, have my object, and then I put my object in an array, and so now I have an array of objects, and then I can stringify those and pull them out. I wonder why I'd want to have an array of objects. Well, maybe we'll find out a little later. All right, web services. Microsoft invented Ajax. We're number one. All right, you know, people always used to kick sand in our face about the web, right? But this is the one thing we invented. And it turns out to be one of the most used technologies on the web. The ability to make a web request, you know. So when Ajax came out like five years after we've been already doing it for a long time, uh, now it's built into JavaScript. But uh, anyway, if you're building, you know, if you've got your back-end systems that you use to run your business and you're exposing that stuff with web services, if you happen to expose them, you know, you can do SOAP and XML, you can do REST and JSON. I think REST and JSON is probably better for the mobile web because it's lighter weight. So anyway, the, we, we've been able to do this for a while. This level two thing is the new one. And so it allows you to do progress events and uploading files. And so like you can actually have events firing and someone can see the progress of these things happening. And then cross domain requests. Normally you can only call back to the domain you came from. So pretty cool stuff here to call your web services. And then don't forget, remember we have JIT compiled JavaScript. All this is JavaScript. So if it's JIT compiled, it means your web service calls are going to be a lot faster than they were before. It's not all just sitting there being interpreted. And again, I'm a big fan. I'm a, a Restafarian, as you may have heard. And so uh, anyway, it's lighter weight, l less bandwidth. Doesn't use as much battery. Why is that? Well, remember, everything's just a giant text parser, right? And so if you have to parse less, you're not using as much battery. And then it's all faster. And remember, UX isn't just about how something looks. Remember I talked about going to the cell tower and taking that whole long trip and back? That's UX, too. I clicked a button. How long did I have to wait for my response to come back? That's user experience. Am I going to leave your site? Well, if you wrote it in REST and JSON and stuff like that, it's going to come back to me faster. Look how stupid, simple an AJAX call is to make. I mean, just do your GET request against, you know, whatever you're using. It could be ASMX. It could be a Razor page. It could be WCF. It could be the cool new web API in MVC4. And then you just have this onload function that calls asynchronously, and then you, uh, you get it back. I mean, it's that simple. Now, I know a lot of you, maybe, are totally into jQuery and jQuery mobile and stuff like that. And so you might be accustomed to using jQuery to do a lot of the things I'm going to describe for you. Since this is not a session on jQuery, I'm just going to tell you the real way to do it. But absolutely, feel free to increase your productivity by using things like jQuery mobile, Knockout.js, and all those things that we provide in Visual Studio to speed your development. Absolutely. But I want to make sure I'm showing you how to, you actually do it yourself. Oh, wait. So remember I talked about arrays of objects? So what happens when I call a web service, and my web service is querying a database table in SQL Server, and it's pulling back rows? from that database and columns, rows and columns. Wow, and it's returning it as JSON. So it's collections of objects, serializes JSON going over the interwebs. And I need to catch those things. Well, it looks like I could just save those things and straight into my web storage database. So now it all kind of comes together. Why would you care about arrays of objects? Because the data you might be returning from your database queries over the web, they're arrays of objects. That's what they are. It's a collection. If you're in native code, you'd have a, a generic list, maybe, of objects. It's a collection, you know, or, you know, observable collection. And here, though, it's just straight that. And so you can slam it right in. You just catch the deal, put it right in web storage. Nothing special to do. And then when you're ready to get it out, just use JSON parse. And then you see this easy for loop where I go through and I grab out all those objects that's in that array. So this is pretty cool stuff. This is, again, this is, this is getting real. It's kind of like Bad Boys 2. This stuff just got real. <laughs> all right, App Cache. App Cache is a huge uh, game changer that makes HTML5 and the web able to potentially replace native for some things you want to do. Not everything, maybe 50%. App Cache allows you to specify what pages you want to download and cache locally, offline. In other words, 
I can, uh, so if I have a whole website of pages and JavaScript and CSS and images and stuff like that, I can list them in there. I'm going to show you an example here in a second. And it downloads those offline. And then I could put my phone in airplane mode, and it still works. And I can still use the website, even though I'm not connected to the internet anymore. That was a critical thing. That's why we did native instead of the web so many times. Well, that just went out the window with app cache. So I can keep browsing offline. Well, there's another benefit, server scalability. I care about that. It means it starts checking and using local pages instead of always hitting the server. It has a way of checking to see if there's stuff new. So don't worry, you're not going to have to worry about stale pages. But the takeaway is by using this, people get a better user experience. They get how much faster do you think it is to load a page that's cached locally versus going to the web server each time, like a billion times faster. You know, so it's all good. So it's just a simple text file, this manifest that you put on your website with your pages, and then you just list them all out, and then, it, and then there's also a way to specify things that you don't want to pull down, potentially. So let's look at, this is, this is how Forrest Gump simple this is. Cache manifest. So there in the cache colon, you list the pages and files and resources that you want to download and cache locally. And then there's this fallback in case something happens. You can back up and say, I'll, I'll load this file if this doesn't happen. And then this network area, you can list pages that you absolutely never want to cache. It's really that simple. I really encourage you to try it out. And then, and then, and then do the test yourself. Make it real for yourself. Build a, build a website. Don't even do anything crazy with programming yet. Just build a bunch of pages and, and put this in there and have it work. And then you know, turn off the network and see if you can still do it. It's pretty, pretty cool. So hand in hand with offline pages is offline data. So I talked about web storage. But web storage has a big brother called IndexedDB. And so web storage, 5 megadata. IndexedDB, though, is for larger amounts of data. I'm pretty sure this starts at 50 meg. And so when we're talking about real line of business, large apps that you've built, I mean, I don't know about you, I've been on a lot of crazy mobile apps over the last decade where we were like had 400 meg SQL CE databases running on SD cards and stuff like that. That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about for this. So big amounts of data. So you're still using your AJAX calls, you're still calling your REST services, but now you're going to put them in these object stores. And so, you know, it's not a relational database. It's kind of like NoSQL. Um, and so, uh, but you'll, you'll, build, you'll serialize and put your JavaScript objects, kind of like we did with web storage, in these larger object stores. Oh, and look at this. You get identity columns. We're all Microsoft people. We love identity columns sometimes in SQL. So you can have that. And then everything is transaction-based for every database Interaction, every last thing is transactional. There's, there's no just get it, whatever. Everything, every last thing you explicitly wrap in a transaction, which is great for devices. Those of us who use SQL CE over the years, there was a time way back when, when it wasn't quite as stable if the device just ran out of battery or just died on you. You might be in an unstable, corrupt state or something like that. And then when we got to about SQL CE 3, that's when we got really good about our ACID support and making sure that all kinds of horrible things could happen on your device, because they will, and everything is still good. That's why IndexedDB works the way it does. It's assuming the worst. When you're programming for mobile and the wireless world, you should be building for the worst possible scenario, right? And so this helps you do it. So just a quick little sample here, and there's lots of great code on MSDN and other places about how to work with IndexedDB. But it's just real simple. This is just kind of like a, a, a create and opening it, you know. And again, through the window object, open it. And there's these, everything is asynchronous. Every last bit of it is asynchronous. So everything comes back to you in an event. You know, yes, it worked. What version? And you can do versioning of all these object stores. And so again, in your mind, just think each, you can create multiple object stores. Each object store is your table basically, of your database. And then you'll have your JSON arrays of JSON, you know, collection objects and everything. Does anybody work with any NoSQL things? Cloud, uh, CouchDB, things like that. Uh, Azure table storage. You know, anyway, 
your experience in working with NoSQL da data, I, I, I'm reluctantly calling them databases. They're not quite, you know, just a bunch of tables. Um, anyway, they're used heavily to do ridiculous scale out on the internet. Uh, but anyway, the same principles apply here. Web workers. Who would have thought that we would get multi-threading on the web? Wow, it's like every slide I go through, the HTML5 seems more and more like real programming, doesn't it? Uh, web workers, we've always had single-threaded browsers. It just runs on the main UI thread. Uh, and so people would have frozen screens or just sit there waiting. This is not unlike what we used to go through over the last decades, you know, when we were, those of us who were doing VB programming in the 90s, single-threaded, right, or access or anything like that, you know, sometimes people just had this non-responsive page, you know, screen, form, whatever. So having background threads allowed us to get around there. So Web Worker API allows you to spawn background threads based on the JavaScript. So, you know, like, so when you're doing threading in native apps, you know, <laughs> thread, thread, new thread, you know, all that stuff, and you maybe point to a class or something, a function that's going to actually do the work inside that. Well, in this case, it just uses things like the web. So your JavaScript file, you have an external JavaScript file, and the code, the script in that JavaScript file is what happens inside that web worker. And so you launch that, and it's all asynchronous, and as you can see, IE10 lets you do 25 active web worker threads per process. So 25 threads. That's a whole lot better than the one you have right now. And so now we're doing threading. So now can you imagine that Ajax web service call on background threads and then slamming them right into IndexedDB or, or uh, web storage? That's starting to get pretty cool. And we're offline because we got app cache. This is, this is cool stuff. And then the UI thread can talk to these background threads. We have a way to do two-way communication. <clears throat> And so here's just a simple deal on instantiating a web worker. It's really that simple. Var worker, new worker, point to the JavaScript file. And then you can see how we can post messages, you know, and have the UI thread talk to the worker thread, and, and the event will fire, and vice versa. Those threads can talk back to the UI thread. And so, hey, I did my stuff, I'm done working, or here's some updated information, update the screen, things like that. So all the stuff that you are used to doing in native programming now you get some more of that here. So let's go back to the Wolf Vision. And I'll show you a little demo on the tablet here. We got this great, you might be familiar with the IE10 test site, test drive site that we have. That's where I got this from. So let's just do this uh, web worker test harness. Come on, focus. All right, whatever. All right, I'm just going to hit start. Basically, what it's going to do is it's, it's starting a test. And so the, basically, it might be, it's not super clear, but the, it's running, it's basically just showing you, it's doing two things at once. So it's, it's performing work on the UI thread and on a background thread at the same time. And it's just kind of showing you, it's, it's kind of racing, you know. It's doing all these, uh, these tests and how many pass and how many fail. Um, the great thing is to help you learn about this, that test drive site has examples for all these kind of technologies I'm talking about, and we have tons of sample code that you can, that you can try out. But this just is, all I'm trying to illustrate here is a quick example of the UI and the web worker cranking away at the same time doing background processes. Web sockets, just when you thought all you could do was HTTP response, request response, there's something even faster. Uh, we all know that when I need to get really, really fast, I do sockets. Lots of people don't do sockets anymore, but I know situations where I've seen companies have to resort to sockets and socket servers to get the performance they need. Well, we've got sockets now here on the web. And sockets also mean push to the browser as well. So it's not just I'm always pulling to get stuff back. I can have this real-time connection. Uh, and do this high-speed, real-time pushing. So I don't have to pull over and over to get new data. I will say, hey, I want to do web sockets. And it's almost like you're asking permission. Now, I'll give you a caveat right now about web sockets. 
It's not as pervasive around the internet as all these other things are. We support it, but it, you know, and we support it in, and I talk about here, it's in, it's in IIS 8 on Windows Server 2012 with ASP.NET 4.5, and you kind of, there's a way to get it going. Um, I have heard sometimes it may have problems going through certain routers or things like that. And a absolutely, inside your enterprise, it, it's great. Um, but just, just giving you that caveat. So what I, and so the reason I say that is, I mentioned, does anyone know what SignalR is? Totally cool. So SignalR rocks. So what I would recommend you do is go to code, actually, it's, it's, it, we actually included it now. It used to be this kind of rogue thing going on by a couple of guys, and it's on CodePlex. Now it's included with all our ASP.NET stuff. And so if you get the latest update, what is it, update two of Visual Studio, it's all, all that stuff's baked in there. So Signal R, what it does is it gives you, it figures out, it wraps all the different ways people have, all the hacks and comment and different things to do push to web browsers that people have done over the years, and it wraps it and makes it super simple for you to set up. And it has sample code for your ASP.NET side, and then for your JavaScript side, and it will test, and it will try to do WebSockets, and if it can, it will be smoking fast, pushed to your browser and going back this way, and if it cannot, it will gracefully fall back and find whatever will work, and it will find something that will work that will still give you that push that you're looking for. And so potential apps, you know, real-time stock trading, online games. And then here's the really funny thing, push notifications for the web. So we have push notifications is a big deal with our phone, and then we added it to big windows, so it has the push notification service and getting toast and updates to your tiles and things like that. Apple has it, Google has it for their devices, but the web doesn't have it. Well, guess what? This signal R is how you can have push notifications for the web. If you just started building a whole suite of web apps, instead of native apps, or to complement your native apps, and you still want push notifications just like you have native, use SignalR. SignalR is the way. So if something changes, maybe there's data that you're subscribed to in your app and you need to know when it changes on the server, SignalR can push a notification to your web app and let you know, hey, something's changed, come get it. The other cool thing, not web related, is all those crazy SignalR guys also built SDKs for native clients too. And so you can use SignalR in your native apps as well, which is really awesome. Let me give you a quick example. Seven minutes. Um, so I do these executive briefings, these EBCs, every week with the CIOs. And I did one. Well, I won't tell you who it is, but it's just this super secret spy agency that you might have heard of. As you might imagine, security is a big deal for them. And I was just talking about Windows Phone 8 and native apps, and I was talking about push notifications, and somebody raised their hand and said, so where do those push notifications come from? I'm like, you know, the cloud over there. And he goes, we can't have that. We don't do cloud, and we don't have things come from outside our network. Things stay, begin, and end in our network because we are so locked down. I'm like, okay, I get that. And they were like, wow, how do we get work around this? And then SignalR just popped in my head. If I'm in a scenario where I can't use push notifications that come from Never Never Land and I need to control the entire end-to-end -end story, SignalR can be my private internal push notifications for my web apps. And since there's SDK for native, I can use that too. So something to kind of think in mind, you know, have in the back of your head if you find a scenario where you want all that push stuff happening on-prem or totally within your data center or private hybrid cloud, it's, it's just another option to look at. So here's setting up a, a simple web socket. So you notice it kind of looks a little strange there, that var host, the WS colon, you know. And, and it's, it's a negotiation. And they kind of negotiate and say, hey, do you support web sockets? Yeah, I do. And then it'll elevate your HTTP to a socket. If it doesn't, then it won't. And it'll keep it as request response. And then there's just how stupid simple it is to send a message to a web socket and then have events to listen for messages coming. And then you can update your DOM and do all your fun, crazy stuff. So pretty darn cool. So I've now finished covering all the coolness of HTML5. I'm hoping you get the power of that and how you could seriously start building enterprise apps using this. I'm not telling you to replace your native apps with this, absolutely not. But Everybody has a decision tree they follow in their brain 
when they're looking at projects to do at their company or for their customers. And when you go down that decision tree, all I'm saying is keep an open mind to this. You may find that in certain scenarios, oh, yeah, HTML5 would actually work for this, or it might be better for this. And then in other cases, it won't. So the last thing I want to talk about is hybrid apps. So back at the beginning, I said Gartner said that 80% of the apps are either going to be mobile web or hybrid. And you're probably going, what's a hybrid app? So a hybrid app, if you don't already know, it's a, it's a hybrid web container. Basically, it got started by um, people wanted to, people, web developers who were great at HTML and JavaScript, and they were not interested in learning native programming. But they sure did want to get their app in the App Store. And they're like, well, how in the world do I do that? And so stumble, bumbling, stumbling along, said, OK, what if I took a native shell of an app, and there's nothing in it, and I put a web view on some platforms or a browser control on others on that, and then the entire guts of my app, 90 whatever percent of my app is all HTML and JavaScript, and it runs locally. Web pages are local. Or they could be remote and use app cache. And, and remember, this was happening. Web hybrid apps were being built before HTML5 standards were widely adopted. So some folks were like, well, I don't have a database, but I could, because part of a hybrid app is two-way communication with the native platform. JavaScript on your web page can call a native function on the native part of your app, and vice versa. Your app can call JavaScript functions. That opens up a lot of possibilities. And so as we've gone through this evolution, of HTML5 immaturity, different browsers only supporting a few things, now they're supporting more. In the past, they would say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll call into the native part from JavaScript to store data. Uh, but now maybe I don't need to anymore because I've got web storage and IndexedDB. But I still will use it to call maybe the camera or the accelerometer or other sensors that HTML5 doesn't address yet. You know, there's this race going on, right? Native's always going to be ahead because native is like the platform, right? And so it's always going to be racing ahead, and HTML is going to be chasing behind. But they're going to be chasing closer and closer behind. You know, HTML5 has made great strides, and there's going to be an HTML 5.1 uh, and get even closer. But that being said, it's a journey. Native, new native things will come up with, you know, that we haven't even thought of yet, and then HTML will have to play catch up. So anyway. If you need to get to some of those native things that you can't get to now from pure HTML5, a hybrid app is the way to do it. And you've probably heard of PhoneGap. PhoneGap kind of takes a, does an abstraction. And, and home, PhoneGap and the Project Cordova with Apache, and there's a whole bunch of others. There's so many different frameworks out there, Titanium, you know, Accelerator, so many. Uh, using Sencha Touch, using all kinds of things. But anyway, if I just think with a PhoneGap example, that Two-way communication, JavaScript to native, native to JavaScript. What PhoneGap did is they wrapped all those common sensor interfaces so that you didn't have to know what it was on a platform-by-platform -platform basis. So if you wanted to build cross-platform hybrid apps using HTML, get them into everyone's store, you know, using, using uh, PhoneGap as a way to do that. We're actually, as we talked about yesterday, Larry, we actually have a contest right now getting uh, PhoneGap apps working because we totally fully support PhoneGap on our platform. So let me show you. This is how simple it is. Right here, platform code, communicating with JavaScript. So the name of your control could be browser, browser1, or whatever it is, dot invoke script, calls the function name, and then passes in the arguments to that function in JavaScript. And then vice versa, JavaScript calling your C sharp, your VB function, and it calls window external dot notify and passes in that stuff. And that's kind of the gist of how you get that, that two-way communication going on. And that's how you get in the store. So this is another option. It's hugely popular. You may or may not be aware of how big the deal this is right now, but tons and tons. You'd be surprised. Giant percentage of apps in everyone's app store are actually hybrid right now. So let's do one last demo. We have 53 seconds left. Just shoot me. All right, I'll go fast. All right, come on, show it. All right, good, good. Okay, let me do something really quick. I'm gonna do new project because we have a we have an official project. There's Windows Phone, Windows Phone HTML5 app, so you don't have to invent this from scratch or not have to know what you're doing. So we have a template for it. It comes up. 
There it is. What did we do? We slapped a browser control on top of a native app. Notice these properties over here where my mouse is. And we, we enable and code, but you, you literally check. Is geolocation available? Is script available? You'll want to check those. I think script is actually done in code for you anyway. Uh, but the takeaway there is to, to allow your JavaScript or not, you know, do those kind of things. So let's, uh, if I look here in the project side here, there's an HTML folder. There's index.htm, so that's, the, that's a page in local storage that we're going to load. So I'm not loading from the web, I'm loading, loading locally. I've got a CSS file design. Whoop, there's that crazy viewport tag I was talking about, and media. Who knew? It's like this stuff's really real. Um, and then the, the code here. You know, I'm going to load this HTML page locally. Here's the browser script is enabled. And then there's the go back and go forward. So let me just run it real quick. We're at zero seconds. That means the bomb's going off somewhere. I didn't cut the blue wire. And there it is. It looks just like a native app, doesn't it? The CSS, the magic CSS, and, and there's lots of other CSS I can show you that it renders all your buttons, everything. It'll look totally metro. Did I say metro? All right. And then, and then it has this little pop-up going back and forward and home. Obviously, we only have one page, so it doesn't work. So let me show you a little more interactivity, if you'll bear with me, for 30 more seconds. Let me cut and paste some stuff in here. So I've got something from Notepad. So I'm going to put a function and a text box on that same web page that it gave us by default. So I'm going to put it down here. And then in the native code, like um, we'll do that, that home item pop up. So where it says home, I'm going to comment out that. And I'm going to just say, I'm going to do that browser invoke script thing that I told you about. Because you know what? I'm a total show me state kind of guy. It's not real until I show you that it really works. So let's run it again. So now you see the text box. And so I'm going to show you native code calling a JavaScript function. I'm going to call home. And there we go. Hello world from C sharp. And there you have it. We're at negative however many seconds. The bomb didn't go off, but we did call a web page from our native code, which is all goodness. So. Start passing. I don't know what we're doing if we're collecting. Did we collect all those uh, surveys to get a free phone? All right, I'm going to ask a quick question from, from, this, from the session here. You have to raise your hand. You can't blurt it out, and I have to pick you. And of course, you have to actually be interested in building apps for tablets, too. So if you're not interested in doing that, don't raise your hand either. How many meg of data can we save in web storage? Way over there. You got it. You with the hat. Excellent. All right. And we got getting together all the surveys. We're going to give somebody a phone. Here you go. Congratulations. All right. Two more seconds to get a phone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. They they wanted the UX designers that you're working with. You know, I know. I, sometimes it gets personal, doesn't it? Or you know, personal preference. Right. Right. You know, I think it's just about screen size and fat fingering and stuff like that. You know. So hang on. Let me see if I got our list back. Do I have everything yet? Where is our person? And there you are. Excellent. All right, get them, get them. Everybody, run up here. Hurry, we got to get a phone. It's important to get a phone. Don't you agree? I'll just yeah. Phones for everybody. Look under your chair. It's Oprah. <laughs> and you get a phone. And you get a phone. And you get a phone. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Here's three more. All right, are you ready? All right, auto shuffler from Vegas. Oh, there's another one. Heart shuffle it. I didn't look. It doesn't it look rigged. All right, just in case. Manpreet Padam, is that right? Did I say that right? Manpreet, are you here? Yay! Woo! 
All right. Excellent. Congratulations. Hey, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time.